Hello folks, uh, my name is Darren. I'm one of the pastors here at the church and we are so glad that you have joined us today. Wherever you find yourself, at home feeding the kids, out for a walk uh, or even in the car, uh, we're delighted you've taken time out of your busy schedule. We can't meet in person, sadly, but that certainly doesn't mean that church has stopped. And we meet together as St Andrews to be encouraged uh, by praising God, uh, to pray to him and hear the Bible read and explained to us. Personally, I think this is uh, uh, one of the advantages of doing church at home because I can sing as loud as I want, out of tune, uh, and no one in the first few rows of the church minds at all. We are going to hear the Bible taught a little bit later by Pastor Alex as we continue our journey in the incredible book of Joshua. We've seen how God uh, fought on behalf of his people and achieved the victory for them last week. But just with that great victory in the back of their minds, we see the terrible consequences of sin and how sin can affect and destroy a community. But before we do that, let us prepare our hearts and come to God in an attitude of worship as we sing Jerusalem. Thank you.
The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down in your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They've taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen, they have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Go, consecrate the people, tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, there are devoted things among you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. In the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe the Lord chooses shall come forward clan by clan. The clan the Lord chooses shall come forward family by family. And the family that the Lord chooses shall come forward man by man. Whoever is caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire, along with all that belongs to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done an outrageous thing in Israel. Early the next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes and Judah was chosen. The clans of Judah came forward and the Zerahites were chosen. He had the clan of the Zerahites come forward by families and Zimri was chosen. Joshua had his family come forward man by man and Achan, son of Kami, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was chosen. Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel and honor him. Tell me, what have you done? Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, it's true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua, together with all the Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold bars, his sons and daughters, his cattle and donkeys and sheep, his tent and all that he had to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him, and after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. Over Achan they heaped up a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, that place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since. 
The story goes of the five-year-old boy who used to see his parents every evening drinking chocolate milkshakes out of small glasses. They didn't share their chocolate milkshakes with him. He wasn't allowed. And then one evening when they had finished their talking and had gone to bed, he waited. And when he could wait no longer, he left his room, went into the kitchen, the lights were out. He got a chair, moved it over to the cupboard, opened the cupboard door, climbed upon the chair, and then reaching as far up as he could to one of the top shelves, he found the bottle of chocolate milkshake. He grabbed it, opened the lid, and began to drink, glug, 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 glug. And then as he was halfway through the bottle, suddenly the lights went on. He was caught, but not the bottle of Bailey's Irish cream. That he dropped and it was smashed to the ground. What do you do when you think that no one else is watching? It's in those moments when your convictions about God are tested. How do your beliefs about God affect your behaviour? Well, today we're finishing our series looking at the opening chapters in the book of Joshua, and we see this incredibly confronting passage. Now, even though the events of Achan happened thousands of years ago, they're profoundly relevant for us because in them we, we see the character of God, but also the incredible danger that we can often find ourselves in. So as we look at this passage, we, we just have two simple points. God's anger, Achan's sin. Our Bible reading began at verse 10. The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I've commanded them to keep. What's going on? Well, last week in chapter 6, we learned about the conquest of Jericho. Afterwards, the Israelites sought to conquer the rest of the land. And at the top of chapter 7, one of Joshua's men says to him, don't send the whole army. The next town is much smaller than Jericho. Instead, send 3,000 men. It, it should be an easy victory. But it wasn't. Those 3,000 men were routed. 36 men were killed. The rest fled in terror. If chapter 6 was overwhelmingly positive, chapter 7 becomes shamefully negative because we've moved from sublime victory to stunning defeat. In verse 6, we're told that the hearts of the Israelites melted in fear. You know, up until that point, it had been the other way around. It wasn't the hearts of the Israelites who had melted in fear. It was, it was those of the inhabitants of the lands as they saw what God was doing. But now the boot was on the other foot and Joshua hears about the defeat and goes into a deep grief. He tears his clothes, falls before the ark of the Lord, sprinkles dust in his hair and he prays, crying out to God all these questions. God, why have you brought us here to be defeated? God, why didn't we stay on the other side of the Jordan River? God, what's going to happen to the honour of your name? It's like defeat has been snatched from the jaws of victory. Joshua is left wondering, is that it? How are we going to conquer this land? That's all in the background. But as Joshua prays, looking for answers, God doesn't leave him without an explanation. He says in verse 11, Israel has sinned and have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them in with their own possessions. That's why Israel were defeated. They disobeyed God. Instead of devoting all of the plunder from Jericho to God, they kept it for themselves. And so then we see the central verse in the whole chapter. God says in verse 12, I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. You see, up until now, Israel was able to move into the promised land because God was with them. They had his presence. God had said to Joshua, if you obey me, I will be with you. But now he's saying to Joshua, I will not be with you anymore. Now, God's anger raises two important questions. First of all, why does God get so angry at Achan's sin? 
When God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt and called them to be his own, he also called on them to be holy. Now, on the one hand, holiness means to be separate. It means that they were supposed to be different from all the other nations around them, what they believed about God and and how they acted in, in, in every aspect of their lives was to be different. That's part of the purpose of the laws that God had given to Moses. It was to show the people how they were to be a society of truth and justice and righteousness. And in other words, to reflect the character of God. Holiness means to be separate. But then on the other hand, holiness also means to be devoted to something, to to have an undivided heart, an exclusive commitment. Imagine for a moment that you're training for the Olympics and and if you're in that situation, you don't say to yourself, well, okay, for 10 hours a week or 20 hours a week, I'll train. But for the rest of the time, I'll do whatever I want. Well, no, you, you can't say that because your coach will be in your ear saying to you, everything in your life has to be directed towards qualifying, participating, winning that medal at the Olympics. Everything, what you eat, your sleep routines, how you train, where you spend your time, everything has to be subservient to that goal. Now that's a picture of holiness. Being devoted to God is not just a portion of your life. It's your whole life. Holiness means to be completely devoted to God, not partly devoted in one area, but then also partly devoted to a rival God. Otherwise, you're not wholly devoted. When Achan disobeyed God and took what was forbidden, he wasn't just failing to be different and and, and, and demonstrate what truth and righteousness look like. He was showing that he had a rival in his heart for God, that he was not wholly devoted to God. It was like Achan was saying to God, I'll follow you in this area of my life, but not that. I think obeying you is important here, but not there. He was trivializing God's word. He was trivializing God and God will not be trivialized. He will tolerate no rivals. That's the first question. But the second is this. Why is it that all of Israel suffered for one man's sin? Look at how it's described in the very first verse of chapter 7. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. You know, Achan took the robe, the silver, the gold. But everybody else is held responsible. One guy did it, but God says all of Israel was unfaithful. In God's eyes, one person's sin was everyone's responsibility. Now, Westerners most particularly are profoundly uncomfortable with the idea of corporate responsibility because we are incredibly individualistic. We don't see ourselves as particularly connected to one another, but more traditional cultures understand this, that both the successes and the failures of one person reflect on the group, that what happens to one has an effect on the many. But throughout the Bible, God is insistent that the personal holiness of the individual is the whole group's concern. Sin is so infectious that when disobedience to God is tolerated in one person, it can spread throughout the entire community. Both Jesus and the Apostle Paul compared sin's effects to yeast working through a whole batch of dough. It affects the whole Do you see what this means? One Christian sin is not a private matter. It affects the whole community of believers because when we tolerate our own sin, it seeps into our own character and behavior and it has effects, implications on the people around you. Look, the New Testament often compares Christian community to a human body. We're each members of that one body, profoundly interconnected and dependent on one another for our mutual health and flourishing. Imagine for a moment that I had a problem with a particular part of my body. It's it's not too hard to imagine, but imagine that I, for instance, had a toothache. Now, 
I could tolerate the pain of that toothache for a little while. I could ignore it and, and hope the problem went away. But after a while, that toothache would begin to affect the rest of my body. I might get a headache, I might not be able to sleep well, I might not be able to eat. And pretty soon, it starts affecting my whole life. The rest of my body suffers. And it's the same thing with Christian community. One person's sin is not a private matter, whether it's immorality or an offence that has been caused to, to somebody or, or, or false doctrine. It affects the whole community's spiritual health. And... Therefore, it will not do simply ignoring it or pretending it's not a problem or hoping it goes away. Sin must be dealt with. That's why so often in the New Testament, it speaks about how church discipline being a necessary and loving part of Christian community. We all are dependent upon one another for our own individual holiness and, and, and godliness. God is insistent that individual holiness is a corporate responsibility. Our personal holiness absolutely matters to God. The, the holiness of God's people absolutely matters to God. That's why God says to Joshua, this must be dealt with, otherwise I will not be with you anymore. So we see God's anger, but second point, we see Achan's sin. Now, the whole assembly of the Israelites were brought before God. And then one by one, first the tribes, then the clans, and then the, the families were brought forward for judgment until finally Achan is selected as the guilty offender. And Joshua says to Achan, tell me, what have you done? Do not hide it from me. Look, think of Achan's situation. What could he have said to Joshua at that point? What do lots of people say when they're accused of doing something wrong? Well, they can either say, it's not wrong if nobody gets hurt, or they could say, it's not wrong if people don't find out. It's not wrong if people don't get hurt. But further down, Joshua says to Achan, look at what you've done. How could you bring this trouble upon us? 36 people are killed. Think of all the, the families that have been damaged, the wives without husbands, the, the children without fathers. Sin always hurts people. Or what about, it's not wrong if people don't find out. Think about what Achan knows about God. He would have known how God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. He would have known about the commandments given him Mount Sinai. He would have experienced God's provision upon him every day of his life. The water from the rock, the manna in the desert. He would have seen how God stopped the Jordan River so that Israel could cross along on dry ground. He would have seen the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. Think of what power and provision, what blessing and kindness Achan had seen from God. Nothing was beyond God's capability. Nothing was beyond his knowledge. Can anyone really say it's not wrong if people don't know about it? Numbers 32, 23 says, be sure that your sin will find you out. Or Psalm 139, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Achan knew he was without excuses. There were no mitigating circumstances. And so he says to Joshua in verse 20, It is true, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw the plunder, a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them and I took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. You know, what Achan says is profoundly insightful. He recognises how sin took a hold of him. And it's vital for you and I that we have the same insight so we can recognise the danger of sin and stop it taking a hold of us. Achan tells us four things about how sin can get a grip on us. Firstly, he said, I saw. 
Perhaps you can imagine the scene, the, the walls of Jericho have come tumbling down, the Israelites stream into its streets. Perhaps Achan has rushed into a home in order to clear it out, but in that home he notices a robe, the silver and gold. The word used in Hebrew for saw means more than simply notice. It means to behold, to gaze at something, to have it capture your attention. You know, that's the first step in being tempted by something. You, you, you notice something that really you haven't noticed before and you keep looking at it. The second thing Achan says is that, well, he considered. How do we know that? Well, Achan describes the robe. He says it was a beautiful robe from Babylonia. That means he did more than look at it. He picked it up and felt it in his hands. He, he felt the texture of the material and admired the quality. He pondered where it came from and how it got there. But Achan also told Joshua about the silver and gold. He did more than simply notice it that it was there. He, he measured how much it weighed. It was 200 shekels of silver, 50 of gold. He, he took the time to weigh it all. Do you see what's happening? Achan is beginning to value these things. He's beginning to admire and esteem them and consider them as precious. He's beginning to think about the possibilities of what it would be like to have these things. And that's where sin begins. It's the inflammation of the imagination. You consider, you ponder the possibilities, you do a cost-benefit exercise. What would it look like for me to have this? What would it look like for me to, to do this? And then... It's an easy move to the third step. Achan coveted. To covet is not simply to have a desire. It's an over-desire. It's this desire that you must have it. It becomes an object of worship to you. It's, it's, it's a rival for gods. Achan didn't consider the Babylonian robe simply to be some shepherd's cloak. It was something stylish and expensive, something that if he had it, people would consider him to be a person of success, a person worth knowing. And the silver and gold provided endless possibilities of security and comfort that would give him certainty in an otherwise uncertain world. When you covet, you have to make certain justifications to yourself. You have to say to yourself, I deserve this. I've done this and this and this. I've worked hard and sacrificed. I owe it to myself. How often do those words appear in the heart of a person who out of envy or vengeance or ambition drags the reputation of somebody else down? Or someone who spends far too much on a luxury item that they could perfectly do without? Or from a man who decides to begin an affair? I deserve this. I owe it to myself. You can say that to yourself, but you can also say, I don't have enough. I need this. And when you say that, you begin to doubt God's provision upon you, that God understands your needs more than you do, that God will provide for you in every circumstance. You start to say, oh, I need to do a little bit extra. But think of Achan. Further down in the passage, we're told about his possessions, that he had cattle and donkey and sheep. In that culture, that marked him out as an incredibly wealthy man. Poverty wasn't Achan's motivation. Covetousness betrays a profound lack of trust in God's provision and that a rival for God has moved into your heart. And the fourth thing that Achan did was that he took. He looked, he desired, he coveted, and that all led him to do what was forbidden. He took what was supposed to be devoted to God. And the implication of this is, is twofold. First of all, Achan was complacent about the dangers of sin. You know, there are always temptations, always dangers to be aware of. He didn't know his own heart. Those particular areas where he'd be more vulnerable to temptation and being deceived. But secondly, he had no accountability in his life, no checks and balances, no structures and boundaries that would enable him to flee once temptation arrived. He had no friends, no family members who were saying to him, Achan, what are you doing taking this? You know how a thermostat worked in an air conditioning system. Once the temperature gets too high, the thermostat activates the air conditioning to bring the temperature down. 
All of us need systems so that when the temperature of temptation rises, a thermostat goes to work to bring the temperature down. It's having accountability software on your computer or your device so you don't look at explicit material. It's having a Christian friend who you can share your struggles with and who will ask you tough questions. It's having regular exposure to God's word so you can meditate and confess and give thanks and, and have God's word put the spotlight on areas of your life that need to change. Complacency is something we should have no room for. J.C. Ryle, the famous bishop from Liverpool, once said, do nothing that you would not like God to see. Say nothing that you would not like God to hear. Write nothing that you would not like God to read. Go no place where you would not like God to find you. Read no book of which you would not like God to say, show it to me. Never spend your time in such a way that you would not like to have God say, what are you doing? Imagine finding yourself in Achan's position, those torturous moments when all the Israelites are brought forward for judgment, tribes and clans, then families, all the while Achan's nervously wondering, will I be found out? Imagine being in that situation. You know, the New Testament speaks of a day when all of us will be brought before God's throne of judgment in front of the God who sees all and knows all and will be reminded of Numbers 32, be sure that your sin will find you out. How could any of us stand on that day? You know, hundreds of years after Achan, his story is hinted at again by the prophet Hosea. The place where Achan died was called the Valley of Achor. And God is speaking to his people, Israel, and he's comparing them to an adulterous and unfaithful woman. And in Hosea chapter 2, he says, Therefore, I'm now going to allure her. I'll lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. There I'll give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. God is speaking to them and saying, instead of judgment, there will be hope. And that hope comes through God's son, Jesus, the only one who was ever perfectly faithful and obedient to God, but who went to the cross for us, taking upon himself all of God's anger and judgment against our sin so that we could be forgiven and have hope. And one day when we find ourselves in front of God's throne of judgment, we're able to say to him, yes, I am guilty. But I know someone who has taken my punishment and borne my sin. His name is Jesus. What can you do in those moments where a rival for God is occupying your heart and you feel this covetous urge? First of all, repent. Come to God, come to God for forgiveness. But then you've got to find Jesus more captivating, more wonderful, more beautiful than anything else that you can chase after. Simply trying to evict something in your heart that's a rival for God is not enough. You've got to fill that place in your heart with what is most fitting. You've got to fill it with Jesus. He's the only one who will completely satisfy you and bring you peace. He's the only one worth fully and entirely following. Let us pray. Lord God, you know everything about us. Nothing is hidden from your sight. You know our secret sins. You know our thoughts and desires. You know how our hearts are prone to wandering away from you. And we ask, Lord, for forgiveness and for your help by your Holy Spirit that we might see our sin and turn away from it and that we might recognize all that you've done for us in Jesus. And be so captivated by him that we want to live for him and please him and serve him in every area of our life. And we pray for our own community, Lord, that we might be people who are not just interconnected, but people who rebuke and encourage and help one another so that together we might walk forward in holiness and people might see our community and give praise to you. Guide us, Lord, we pray in all these things. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. 
You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Our Father in heaven, thank you that you know each and every one of your children intimately, and that you love us even though you can see all our flaws and failures. Please help us be people who absolutely delight in your sovereignty and are quick to repent of our sins. In your kindness, grant us a desire to continually grow in our knowledge, obedience, and love for you. Grant us hearts that find joy in listening to your word and faithfully living out your commands. Help us trust that your ways are always good, even when they challenge the selfish desires of our own hearts. We now turn to pray for the world. Father, thank you for the growth of the gospel in Taiwan. We pray that there will be many opportunities for the gospel to be proclaimed, especially among the university students there. Please continue to strengthen the work of the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students and other Christian organizations working on campus. We pray that many students will turn to Christ. We also continue to pray for the restraint of COVID, especially in countries currently suffering from high infection rates. Please have mercy on all those who are suffering physically, mentally, emotionally, and financially as a result of this incredibly long and draining pandemic. We pray for relief and healing. We pray that your will be done in all of this. And we pray that you will grant your people endurance and a bigger perspective to find their everlasting hope and peace in you alone to make it through. Father, we now pray for our city. With all the hardship that Hong Kong has faced in so many ways, through recent events and circumstances, we pray that you will continue to sustain the weak and weary. Rather than all this resulting in people hardening their hearts and putting up walls to protect themselves from more mental and emotional pain, please instead help the people of the city to open up their hearts as they search for comfort and healing. We pray for more gospel opportunities in our city. And so, Heavenly Father, we now turn to pray for St. Andrews. Please grant us the privilege as a church to be generous with this precious gift we have as Christians. Give us the heart and courage to want to share the gospel with those around us who so desperately need the joy and hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Help us truly believe in the core of our being that it is your word that brings life, that the best way we can love our neighbors is actually to share the gospel with them and tell them about Jesus. Give us wisdom and compassion to do this in a loving, and helpful way to those you have placed in our lives. We pray that you will use us mightily during these times to advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, folks, we're approaching the end of our service. But as I said earlier, we can't meet in person. But that certainly doesn't mean that church has stopped. Uh, there's still lots going on between children's and youth programs. Our growth groups are still meeting online. And if you'd like any information about children's or groups, please do get in touch with the church. And as well, if you're a person who is struggling, if you know someone who's in need, um, I think more than any other time, it is so important for the church to care for one another. And if you do have specific pastoral needs, please do get in touch with the office. And as always, we're so thankful for your support, for your prayers, and also for your giving. Uh, St Andrews is entirely funded by its members and we certainly are thankful for enabling the ministry to continue. If you'd like to give to the work of the church and the work of the gospel here in Hong Kong and around the world, please look at our website for more ways in, in which you can do that. So wishing you all a safe and blessed week. Do stay healthy and do stay warm. Goodbye. <laughs>